doing under the um, Five College Mellon Foundation Bridging Grant, uh, which is specifically to have humanities majors think about ways that they can bridge into uh, work uh, for pay at um, various public humanities, museums, other kind of programs. Uh, David Glassberg and I teach public history and environmental history at UMass Amherst. And it's really a delight to see people and also, we'll say a little bit about the program because we are meeting this, actually we have a two year grant, so we're meeting this year and next year to try to bring together all of the different people uh, in the five colleges who in one way or another are interested in training uh, undergraduate students in particular for uh, thinking about careers that probably didn't even exist a long time ago, uh, about public humanities and things like that. And I thought it was important, in fact, we all thought it was important to have a kind of foundational talk about what is public humanities from someone who uh, was called upon to create a public humanities program a dozen years ago um, at a time when nobody else was doing that. Um, and so it really made a lot of sense to bring Steve Lubar here as part of that series. Uh, Steve, for many, many years, uh, was a curator at the National Museum of American History. And um, I remember actually seeing some of his earlier stuff, the Engines of Change exhibit, and um, some of his other ones, um, and was really impressed. And I've always been sort of an admirer from, from afar when he was there. We never actually met while he was at the Smithsonian, even though I was a, a, a pre-doctoral fellow there. Um, I left the, the year before he came. Uh, he's had a number of publications, uh, has got a very active blog, which uh, people can learn a lot about. Um, but I think the experience that um, is most interesting is really over the last uh, dozen years or so uh, at Brown University directing this new program uh, in public humanities. And at the time, uh, there really weren't any. There was public history. And it's interesting, and I'm always curious to know why Brown decided that they wanted to do public humanities and not public history. Um, now, there are a number of other schools that are uh, trying to follow suit. I think those schools don't have necessarily a great foundational background to think about this in the same way that Brown did when they, um, when they hired Steve, because Steve had all this experience, in fact, working in the public humanities um, and wasn't just sort of a, a college professor that was assigned to that job uh, kind of at random as some universities have, have, have done. But enough about that. Um, so I don't think I need to say a whole lot more because I don't want to take time uh, away from Steve's talk except to say that we're all in for a real treat. A couple of years ago he spoke at the 25th anniversary of the public history program, and I think everyone in the audience was really very dazzled by what he had to say. So, um, not to raise the bar too high, but prepare to be dazzled. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. Can, can you hear me if I just use this lapel microphone? Okay, great. Um, thank you for that talk. I, I was certainly tempted to see if I could get away with giving the same talk that I gave at the, the 25th anniversary. Um, it was it was my best PowerPoint ever, so I was sort of fine. Oh, I can show that off again. But uh, I've actually used it a couple of places. It's retired now, so I have this new one going on the road with. I'd like to thank Cheryl for Cheryl Hammond for setting this all up. Thank you so much, and for finding my secret um, Twitter. Uh, picture up there of uh, me as, as Charles Wilson Peel. Uh, I have to give one of my students uh, had that idea. She said, "You look just like him." Just... So anyway, that's, that's, that's the, uh, this is a flyer that, I, that you've seen. This is sort of the instructions I was given. Uh, it's a bit of an odd talk because it's really a sort of an inside inside baseball kind of talk, a professional talk for folks who are interested in these programs. Um, 
I guess I should say, I added a little bit of the title, looking back, looking around, and looking ahead. It's a moment that's useful for me to look back. Uh, I've been director of the John Nicholas Brown Center for Public Humanities and Cultural Heritage and the MA Program in Public Humanities for 10 years. The way Brown works is you have five-year terms as directors of things. And I had two, which was enough. And I'm um, pleased to be out of it, but also, you know, a few months uh, since, since July, I guess, not being in, in charge, has given me a little bit of perspective and has also, frankly, given me a little bit of freedom to say things that you can't really say when you're director. You can be more critical when you're no longer director. So I can sort of have a little bit more perspective, maybe, than I once had. So here's what I'm going to, to try to do today. Um, I want to step back and think about where did that 10 years go? What have we done? Uh, what would I do if I were starting from scratch now? Uh, what have I learned in the program of trying to run this? Um, and then looking ahead, what I'm thinking about now, what I'm worried about, what, what I'm hoping that the next public humanities program will do. So let me start with looking back. Um, and I thought it might be interesting for those who are students of iconography to show you the <laughs> of semiotics, as we say at Brown, uh, to show you these logos of the four, well, over the course of 10 years, we've gone through four logos. Uh, the center started when I got there as this John Nicholas Brown Center for the Study of American Civilization. Uh, as you can see, it was all about this very elegant building. Uh, changed that logo and changed the name, and uh, then See the building in that second one, the blue one, it sort of faded into the background, but still there. Uh, it disappears altogether in the third one, maybe five years ago. Um, uh, complicated, logos always have this complicated meaning to the people who make them that nobody else ever gets. <laughs> um, it was important at the time. So that's actually a picture of, uh, based on the, the gate to our, our building. So it's a gate, it's symbolic. It's also sort of a takeoff on the NEHH logo. So H, they, have a, they do humanity straight, we do it crooked. Uh, so that was sort of feeling. <laughs> and the last one is mostly about intersections and you know, no longer about a physical place, more about abstraction. And for those who are real insiders, the, the UNESCO cultural diversity logo is very much like this. It sort of some, has, has some, some, uh, some interesting uh, meaning. Again, logos are always more meaningful than people who spend hours and hours of meetings this is where we started. So this is 2004. Uh, you'll see it's all about this wonderful building, this wonderful historic house. Uh, the mission statement was pretty much about the house and about the Brown family papers. Uh, the Browns had given this building uh, as a center to the university. This is the house, to give you a little bit of background, it's a 1792 wonderful wood frame house on, in, on College Hill. Uh, had been lived in by the Brown family, after whom Brown is named, since, uh, well, 1820s or so, until 1984. Uh, they tried setting it up as a center of their own, as a scholarly center. Uh, in 1994, they gave it to Brown. Uh, we have some very interesting and clever restrictions on it, for those of you who are uh, interested in complicated nonprofit 501c3 kinds of things. The John Nicholas Brown Center is not part of Brown University. It's a separate 501c3 with one member, which is Brown University. This is a really clever gimmick. Go into that more if you'd like. But it's an interesting idea of how to both give something and hold on to it, which is what so much uh, nonprofit work is about nowadays. So we changed that fairly soon. Of changing it towards being public humanities. The main thing you notice here is that the focus is on connecting, on students and faculty connecting to the public. Um, the most recent logo, most recent mission statement, cuts out the university altogether to stop communities. And to my mind, that's the key transition that we've made in public humanities. And I think that so much of public humanities work has made over the last decade or maybe the last 15 years. Um, it's no longer about saying universities do humanities, 
we are, we are a place to connect the public so they understand the wonderful work we're doing. Uh, it's much more now about saying, we all do humanities. You, the communities, people outside the university are doing humanities. We can help you out with what you want to do. So it's not about us, it's about them. Um, we'll help you do work that's useful to you. Tell us what we can do for you. So just a quick comparison. Uh, one of them is longer, one of them is shorter. Shorter is always better in mission statements. But more important, it's about uh, this program connecting, or working with communities rather than um, connecting university, communities back to the university. Uh, there's three parts you'll see here. There's MA program, engaged research, and professional development. And so the first part, I'm just going to go through those three parts quickly. Um, I have a good bit here about the MA program, which I'm, I'll go through quick, quickly. If it turns out some of you are interested in particular in how that program works, I can just talk more about it. How it came to be and why it grounded public humanities, I think is probably um, more, well, it's not as complicated as it might be. Uh, the center was part, became part of the American Studies Department. Uh, and I think there was a calculation going on that public humanities is to American studies, it's public history is to history. Uh, the history department at Brown at that time had no particular interest in public history kinds of work. Uh, the American Studies Department did. And the notion was, we'll broaden it out, we'll do all the things that American Studies does and call it public humanities. There, was some, there were no earlier programs, but there were some conferences and some events, and Santa Barbara in particular had a lot going on that they were calling public humanities at the time. University of Washington in Seattle had programs that were called public humanities. So it wasn't completely new, but it was the first MA program. This is what we said the program would do. This is 2007, about the time we really figured out and got started. Uh, we said that we would become interpreters of the humanities of the humanities to the public. Again, this early version of we will interpret things to you. Um, bridging the gap between the university and the community. Um, and then we will train people to become leaders in programs. Uh, this is, there's tension in this. If you read this closely, it's about both sharing and merging uh, between the university and uh, community. That's always the tension in these programs. This is the flyer from just a few years ago, uh, partly in response to the endless student complaint, but what is public humanities? So we always define public humanities, uh, write new mission statements as part of class projects. And so this was a flyer, our students define the public humanities. Um, and these are all pictures from programs that we, the students have done. Uh, then you can see here, the, uh, this is the details of the program. Basically, it says, um, here it is a little bit closer up. Our graduates are innovate, collaborate, and lead in public, public forums. Uh, and uh, basically, there's three things that you do. And this is now, this has been pretty consistent for the last few years. You should know something about the theory of the public humanities. You should know something about, you should have an expertise in some academic field and then you should have practical skills. And the students are all about balancing those three, uh, three categories. Uh, I think over the years, we have become more towards the last one of those. We've become more about gaining um, practical skills to do work. Um, I say we have two required courses, and there's one that's very close to required, and maybe soon, which is nonprofit management. Um, so we are becoming more and more about uh, practical skills. And that's very much a function of the job market. This is our most recent brochure. You can see the university is not mentioned in here at all. It's communities connecting with arts and culture. Um, that's sort of the, the direction we've gone now. So this is the brochure that just came out last year. MA program, very quickly again, Many of you are faculty want to see how this is set up. Um, 12 courses, two practicums, two required courses. One of them is called introduction, which is a theory course. One of them is called methods, which is much more a series of practical kinds of things, usually including a project. One practicum over the summer, one practicum usually in the second year, usually in the top of 
Boston. Um, and then figuring out the right combination of other courses so you have enough content to, to be able to, to do serious research, to, to do serious work at an uh, organization, but enough practical skills that you know how to, to do informal education, know how to do um, development, know how to do that kind of skill. Uh, 10 to 12 students a year, um, been pretty consistent, a little bit higher at times, a little bit lower. That's what we aim at. We get roughly 75 or 80 applications each year to, to choose from. There's also um, a version of the MA program for PhD students at Brown. Jessica is a, a alum of that program. Uh, two required, the same two required public humanities courses, one practicum over the summer, and then some field or pieces of several fields of the preliminary exam that is uh, in public humanities. Uh, we have uh, between three and eight PhD students each year coming. Last few years has been towards the lower side of that. And between zero, one, two, or three of them will usually take this. Um, there's some talk now of making this required for more of the PhD students as uh, something that Brown is particularly good at. Still, still being discussed. So the graduate program is, well this is the official line that we tell the graduate students when we're advertising the program. Um, collaborative, applied, experiential, all words we like. And it's hands-on, skill-based is other thing. We do lots of projects. The program is really designed around doing projects. Um, I think that's the right thing to do, but it may also be just that I really like doing projects, and so we have to do a lot of projects. I do think that is the way you learn uh, a lot of this work. Um, we do, like I say, two courses. This is the, the front part of the syllabus of each of the two courses. The introduction course is very much about theory. Uh, it's what I'm teaching now. Uh, so it's things like museums in the public sphere, uh, reading the number of case studies is part of that golden case of memory. That's what I'm supposed to be ready to talk about on Wednesday, but which I'm not. Um, the methods course is much more practical. It's sort of mostly lecture, a little bit of seminar, uh, and then usually a large or several large exhibit projects as part of that. And I'll show you some of the pictures of those kind of things later on. Uh, the way it's set up is, you know, it used to be set up, it was a two day a week course, and one day was lecture and other day was projects. We also sponsor lots of other courses. Uh, some of these are taught by adjuncts who are all professionals in the field. Some of them are taught by um, RISD Museum or RISD staff. We have a complicated relationship for uh, students who take courses at RISD. Uh, we pay RISD to teach some of the courses. Uh, some of them are taught by postdocs. So this was last year's uh, courses at the center sponsored. Um, we've always had the sense that we could take departments any place across the university. Um, and so these are the departments that we overlap with a lot and that we get a lot of cross-registration to. Archaeology, the Joukowsky Institute for Archaeology has actually been our strongest partner in many ways. Archaeologists take cultural heritage very seriously now, and so um, they've been eager to work with us a lot. Uh, theater and performance studies turns out to have so much of overlapping theory with public humanities. Uh, it's not a field that I know anything about, but it has turned out to be a, a very close relationship. Um, some areas better than others. History department at Brown, uh, until the last couple of years, was not interested in public work so much. Uh, that's starting to change, which is nice. Music department at Brown has always had a strong ethnomusicology program, and so that's worked out there. We don't think, though, that courses are the only way for students to learn. So we do a lot of workshops. Uh, some of them very practical, like job hunting workshops. Uh, some of them about branding. Some of them, you see here, uh, public speaking. Uh, some of them really practical, as in power tools. Uh, one of my <laughs> new, uh, museum director told me he'd hired somebody from another program. And she showed up. It turned out she didn't know how to build walls. And what use were these programs that you can actually build things? So we said, all right, we will, we will teach people how to build things as part of our program. It's always a very popular kind of uh, program. 
Uh, so we do lots of workshops. And then, like I said, practicums are really important uh, for two reasons. One is that students learn a lot over the summer doing practicums, but they mostly learn a new kind of seriousness and a new focus for the second year that is really quite wonderful to see. Uh, they come back sometimes very frustrated, uh, but they also come back with a sense of, here's the kinds of things I need to know while I'm here the second year. So that's been very useful. Uh, we work pretty hard to set up practicums. They are all over the country, all over the world. And um, just, just looking at the, the last two years worth of a lot of art, a lot of history, that's our usual, our usual kind of interest. Uh, some politics, um, anyway, get a sense of what that is. Roughly 10 weeks. We have a very complicated system, probably too complicated, of agreements and uh, writing uh, assignments over the course of the summer. And then a similar set of projects over the, over the uh, usually the spring term of the second year. Where students go, this is a survey from a couple of years ago, but you can see uh, communications, PR, uh, arts management, some of the big topics that we do a lot of. Where they end up, a surprising number end up at universities. Um, I think that's in part because a lot of them stay around, want to stay in Providence, and Brown is really the only place that's hiring very much in Providence. Uh, but it gives you a sense of some of the, some of the places that, that students have gone and what they've done. Uh, the program has been going for 10 years. It's time to rethink it. I think every program should be rethought, um, probably more often than that. So a lot of this may change in the next couple of years as we try to figure out new directions for the program. So engaged research uh, is a second stool, second leg of the stool that we, we, we talked about in the center. Uh, engaged research, engaged scholarship is a buzzword that I'm still not very comfortable with because it means different things to everybody who uses it. Uh, so different parts of Brown, different parts of universities will talk about service learning or community-based research or public scholarship or being public intellectual. Um, these are all overlapping terms. Engaged scholarship or engaged research, to my mind, is about a reciprocal relationship with the community. It's about usually not individuals in the community, but working with organizations and communities. Uh, it's about integration of teaching and research and service in the university. Um, it's still, like I say, it seems like a fuzzy idea. Uh, it's very important, just practically speaking, inside the university. It is something that the provost really likes us to talk about. Uh, we're not about service learning at Brown, we're about engaged research. Uh, Annie Volk, who was the deputy director of the center until, until the summer when she moved to Williams, uh, was really the one who helped me understand how this worked and did some wonderful projects. So the projects I'm going to show about engaged research are really her, her projects. One of them, a project at National Park Pond, which is a historic uh, polluted pond in, in Providence where the uh, Gorham Silver Factory used to be. Uh, she's done archival work. She and her students have done archival work. They've done lots of oral history work. Uh, they've shared what they've learned back to the community. They've tried to make the area better as part of their work. All of those things are part of the engaged research that any did around National Park Pond. This is the website from that project. Lots of work with local schools, with local artists. Uh, they're building things, they're doing environmental work as well as academic historical work, combining it all together. Another project, again, uh, Eddie's, Eddie Locke's work. Uh, this is a project that I find fascinating, I found fascinating since it started. Uh, this is a, Fox Point is a, mostly Cape Verdean or traditionally Cape Verdean Portuguese community, uh, basically right next to Brown, now mostly gentrified and uh, sort of Brown students live. Uh, but the local folks from that area, with help from the program, with help from students, set up a Flickr site and started to gather everybody's photos. And you can see on here, there are 20,000 pictures that have been gathered by community members working with students on this site. 
fascinating to me is how different this kind of research is, this kind of archive is, done by the community than what the university would do. Uh, this is no clear distinction between past and present. It was last summer's vacations and old pictures somebody found in an attic are all together. Words and images just mixed together. You can take it and scan it and put it up here and you have an amazing uh, opportunity to, to understand the research, to understand this neighborhood. Uh, but Taichat is also a rather more academic version of it. You see a difference in the photographs here. Uh, this is oral history site that any students have done. Uh, this, you know, the, the one of them the, is on Flickr, which has all sorts of archival problems. This is on the Brown Digital Repository. It will be saved forever. On the other hand, it's harder to get to. It's harder for everybody to use. There's some really interesting comparisons between this kind of community-based research project and university-based research, university research project working with the community. Another project to point to about what engaged scholarship might look like, this is a brief description of the American Dance Legacy Institute, which is one of the uh, pieces of the John Nicholas Brown Center for Public Humanities. Uh, the ADLI does research in the history of American dance in order to make it available for students to learn how to do these dances. So they work with choreographers, uh, many famous choreograph choreographers have done work with them, and then they take those pieces and make it available for high school students, for, for beginning adults. Um, and they also archive this work. Uh, again, they're doing this combination of academic research, community work, community outreach, um, and that seems to be one of the things we all want to be doing as part of the communities. The last part of those three, those three categories, the last category was community work. Um, we do, we have a complicated relationship with community organizations. Uh, universities really always have complicated relationships with community organizations. We have a program of what we call community jobs, where graduate students in the program work for local organizations, these are some of the ones that they work for, some at Brown, some outside of Brown. Uh, the center pays them, they're doing work for these organizations. <coughs> uh, this, we started this up actually when the, when the crash happened in 2007, 2008. Um, have nobody any money to, to hire anyone. Are you worried about it now? Are we putting people out of work because we're paying students to do their work? Um, is it good educational work? Some places work better than others. Um, but one of the things the center should do, I think, is to make, to use the resources of the university to do good for the community, and this is one way to do it. We also do a lot of advising, consulting uh, the staff members of the center, working with students on many of these projects, are out there trying to do consulting, uh, mostly for free, just sort of helping out with organizations. One thing that we set up, which never worked, and I really wish it had, but someday I may go back to this, or if anybody wants to steal this idea, you're welcome to steal the idea, the Public Humanities Clinic. Uh, this is inspired by the Environmental Health Clinic at NYU that Natalie Jeremichenko set up. Uh, the idea is we set up a space with scanners and printers and designers and Community organizations that need help can come in and get help. Uh, I still think it could work. Just to put the effort into it. To make it work. So, if anybody wants it, they can have the website address. So that's sort of what we've done. Um, another way of thinking about this, what I turn to now, is thinking about what I've learned. So one of the things I did last summer was try to pull together some basic principles of public humanities. At the time I thought I would write this up, and I'm not sure if I will, but it's been very useful for me to think through what I've learned and what makes for good public humanities programs. So what I'm calling this is seven rules for public humanities. Um, I'm going to give you each rule and then illustrate it with a few projects that we've done that partly is a way to talk about projects 
and partly as a way to uh, talk about what's worked and what hasn't worked. So rule number one, it's not about you. So public humanities is not about what you as a professor or you as a discipline, part of a discipline or the university needs, but it's about what individuals in the community outside the university need and want. So it's not that you know the old saying about the federal employees, we're here from the government, we're, we're from the government and we're here to help. It's not that we're from the university and we're here to help. It's rather more like, what are you doing already? How can we participate? How can we be useful? Um, it's not about teaching people things so much, I don't think. It's about a dialogue. Uh, public history is all about sharing authority. And I guess this is about sharing shared authority and also shared knowledge and shared expertise. That's, that's what I mean when I say it's not, it's not about you. Um, project that we did at the Fox Point Elementary School, the Fox Point Gregorian Elementary School. Uh, we had a sense of what we thought was important about the history of that neighborhood. It turned out it wasn't at all what fifth graders in the elementary school thought was important to part. And it's, what we learned is you go with what the audience is interested in. Uh, it's not about us coming in and telling them this is what you need to know. Um, another project not quite successful, we did a student consulting project to write a report on University Historic Health Museums. This was a consulting project for Liberty Hall Museum at Keene University in New Jersey, uh, trying to figure out how it was that universities that have historic house museums, and there's, there's a couple of dozen out there that have these things, how they can be places that work for the community and for the university. And I think the answer is it's a really hard problem. We never really figured that one out. But the notion was we need to talk to all sides of this to write this report. The place where this works well is in cultural heritage. <laughs> cultural heritage people have figured out a lot of this already. I know University of Massachusetts is uh, leading in that, that work. Um, thinking about who your work is for is central to cultural heritage work. So when we work with the archaeologists at Brown, they know they can no longer do what they did for a century or so, which was to go and grab the stuff they wanted to leave they have to work with uh, local organizations and the local communities. The most recent project along these lines is a website and an oral history project called Imagine Properties. Here, our voice isn't in it at all. It's all about these are the voices of community leaders and properties. We step out of it, let them do the talking. Uh, this was done as a way to introduce students to properties. Of course, StoryCorps is a mutual example of the <coughs> experts getting out of the way, letting people talk to each other. Uh, we sponsored StoryCorps when it came to Providence, and it turned out to be a very interesting experience, uh, not only for the people who are part of it, but then for the students who got to listen to this and recut these stories in a, in a, in a new and different way. But again, letting people tell their own story that relates very much to my second point, which is, yes, you're an expert. That's one of the things you are. But just as important is you're a facilitator and a translator. So that has something to do with the web 2.0 with the shared authority, oral history, in exhibits. But it's mostly about being, uh, being part of a conversation, uh, not just an expert or a translator and expert. So one thing, this is a wonderful little project when RISD did an exhibit on cocktail clothes. We did an exhibit on cocktails and conversation. I put it in here to think of maybe the public humanist is sort of like the host at a cocktail party. Mm -hmm. It's not about you telling your story, it's about introducing people to each other. Uh, you're a facilitator, you're helping other, make, other people make connections. Uh, you're a catalyst rather than part of the part of the story. Uh, the most recent project this last year, students worked on uh, this wonderful building in Providence, the Broad Street Synagogue, which is slowly falling down, in part because the community where it is has no connection with the folks who owned it, who used to be the, the members of the synagogue. Uh, how you can become facilitators between those two communities is really a challenge for the project. Um, 
may or may not work out. It's a hard project to, to know what to do with this wonderful now All right, number three, rule number three of my seven, seven rules. Uh, scholarship starts with public engagement. That is, you don't do your scholarship first and then go out and find out about it. Um, the notion there is an applied humanities or a translational humanities are some of the words that are used up there. But rather, um, think about what happened to public art. So public art in the 60s and 70s was about um, artists would do work, figure out a place to put it, show it up there, and the public would like it or not. Um, that was the model for public humanities for us earlier on. Now if you look at the way public art is done, it's very much about you start with conversations with the community, you start with what they're interested in, you start with what needs to be fixed in the community, in the neighborhood, and then you come back and you make your art around it. So my question is, what happens if we do humanities the same way? We were fortunate to have a number of uh, faculty and students who took this seriously. Matt Garcia, who is now at Arizona State, based a wonderful project on oral histories of Latina uh, educators in California. So Jessica, did you work on this project? Yeah. Uh, this was Matt brought students out there to, to talk to these people. He brought the uh, folks, the teachers, into, into Providence. And he did a website and an exhibit. Uh, he really told their story as part of it. He put them at the center of the story. Uh, he gave them tools to tell their story. Another project we've had long history of relationships with Chinese food. Uh, again, working with the owners or the retired owners of Chinese restaurants. Uh, students published papers out of this. Two students uh, have published papers based on their work around uh, Chinese food or uh, Chinese food and Cambodian donut making. Um, but it's also been exhibits and been a whole series of projects based starting from these restaurant owners, one of their stories told, one of their stories preserved. Okay, rule number four, uh, communities define community. This goes back to my sense that it's not about working with individuals, it's about working with organizations. Uh, my sense is that it's the best thing you can do is help out existing organizations, not try to invent new ones. I'll come back to this when I talk about social entrepreneurship, which I have problems with. Uh, but this is about helping existing organizations work, letting communities define themselves. Uh, National Park Pond is an example. Um, Underground Rhode Island, a uh, Paul Buell project, uh, was about the underground world of artists in Rhode Island. Um, I mentioned Fox Point. This, this was a project that was in some ways um, the most complicated. It's about the Cape Verdean community in Fox Point. Cape Verdean community, for complicated reasons, is a very complex uh, community with lots of people disagreeing with each other. Um, who spoke for that community was really complicated. Uh, who, I mean, just when we did this wonderful exhibit, uh, when we talked to, to men in the community, the most important space was the bar. It had to be there. That was the place that they gathered. We talked to women in the community, they said, absolutely not. You cannot show off a bar. This, this, we don't want to be known as people who cry out of bars. So who, who the community is is really complicated, but figuring out how the community works, how the community defines itself, and then giving it back to them. We invited lots of Fox Pointers into this exhibit to, to, see, the, to see what they had done. Just a few more uh, work on a, a student exhibit project at the Hoffman Effort Museum, the Day of the Dead exhibit. That one we did work on. That was wonderful. Um, wonderful poster done by a, a student in the program. Again, working with community organizations, this was about um, gang violence in, in, in Providence. Um, the one last year was some ways sort of the trifecta of, uh, of, of student projects. This was an exhibit uh, about Guatemalan weavers in New Bedford. Um, New Bedford has a large Mayan community now. Uh, folks who refugees mostly, uh, who have set up uh, weaving co-ops, doing uh, traditional weaving, trying to make a living uh, doing traditional weaving in the country. Uh, 
it turns out the Hoffman Reference Museum at Brown has a huge collection of Guatemalan uh, weavings. Uh, the Whaling Museum has a wonderful space and was very eager, the Whaling Museum in New Bedford, was very eager to get um, the Guatemalans to come to visit the museum. They never saw it as part of their story. So the students pulled all of this together into an exhibition between the two museums, between the community, uh, with students, with local, with, with artists, and they built this quite lovely exhibition that you know, succeeded in the goal of the Whaling Museum of getting for the first time lots of Guatemalans coming into the museum to see this, to see this exhibit. Uh, it succeeded in the Hoffman Effort Museum and that it got their stuff out on display to a larger public that would ever come to that museum. Um, and then it worked for the, for the students as well. They uh, worked, worked with these artists and uh, ended up with uh, museums buying some of the materials that the artists that, that the weavers had made. So that leads to rule number five, which is work with artists. Um, let's go through these quickly. Uh, calling something art rather than calling something scholarship is probably the most freeing move you can make in the public humanities business. Makes it, you have lots more flexibility when you work with artists. Museums around the world have figured this out. Museums and history museums around the world have figured this out. History museums in this country don't do this very well. But we've done a lot of projects. Uh, we invited artists to come and look at the building that we're in. Uh, let artists be inspired by history and also interpret it. We were fortunate that Paul Buell had amazing contacts with artists. So Ben Tatcher came to the exhibit with us. Um, uh, we brought in RISD students to design that exhibit. Well, Paul Buell, as some of you know, has done a lot of work with uh, doing history in comic books. And so he had wonderful connections with comic artists and uh, class project of, of connecting his uh, book that he was working on to a larger audience. Uh, Ralph Rodriguez, professor in, in American Studies, had somehow knew Los Pros Fernandez, the uh, Latino and Chicano uh, graphic novel producers, and brought them in, uh, did a wonderful exhibition around them. Uh, professor Haviland brought in two German artists who talked about Memorials, arts and memorials, student project of uh, paintings done, court martial painted paintings that are based on descriptions of runaway slave acts, a very moving uh, way of thinking about those people in our history. Um, back to the Fox Point Oral History Project, an artist came in to uh, turn oral histories into uh, comic books. Um, doing a project with us now, we're doing a project. A couple of students are working on uh, Coney Island oral histories, which are available, turning some of those into the short comic, comic books format. The project that I'm talking to some of you about today, the last year's project, I think may be my all-time favorite project at the museum. Uh, the Jig Society for Lost Museums uh, recreated working with artist Mark Dion, the former uh, Jex Museum of Natural History at Brown. created this wonderful space, thought about it, worked with 80 artists to recreate the objects that have been lost from the museum, uh, recreated the space of Texas artists. So lots of ways to work with artists, and I really think uh, it, it's a wonderful way to, to expand the possibilities. Think digital. Um, this is not something the center has done as well as it ought to. It's not just about digital humanities, which I see as a narrow piece of digital. It's mostly about digital outreach. I mentioned earlier uh, the Flickr site is Fox Point. <coughs> Using these very easily available, commonly used tools, um, how do we use those to public humanities? We've been involved with the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities and a whole uh, seven or eight different communities and partners to start to do a online curate space based um, iPhone uh, app of, of as a tour of Rhode Island history. Um, we've done some local ones, working with local historical societies, uh, Sakonic historical. We're still trying to figure out the best way to do this. A student project, uh, which is a 
complicated augmented reality project about HP Lovecraft in, in Washington, in, in Providence. Go around and pull up your iPhone to a building and odd things appear on your on top of the building on your screen. Uh, it's been, been a lot of fun. But again, thinking digital is important. Number seven, my final rule, practical skills. Um, where, like I say, we have come more and more to say this is really important. When you ask students what was the most important thing they learned on the program, a lot of them now are saying project management skills. Um, I think this will change over time. I think their first jobs are more practical. In 10 or 20 years, the, the theory and the big picture will be more important. But we're doing things, everything from you know, how to read a balance sheet to doing oral history. So everybody does project management, a lot of projects, a lot of project management. Research skills are real important. This is a project that a student, uh, Lara Montero, did. Uh, she got a group of students to just research every single thing on one street of Providence, from the street light to the sidewalk. Uh, lots of research. Uh, we've worked with a number of other universities on the Guantanamo Public Memory Project. Lots of just giving tours to the public, teaching the public informal education kinds of projects. Uh, exhibition projects, um, like I say, students are in contract, project management, public work. Uh, they learn some of them how to hang a banner on the side of a building. There's Mr. Peel hanging on the side of one of those buildings. Uh, and just organizing events. Uh, and finally, they learn how to talk about difficult topics. So lots of very practical skills. This was another exhibition, um, sex education, which was very uh, So anyway, that's some of the projects. So I've done where we came from, what I'm thinking, uh, what I've learned, and now very quickly, the next few minutes, sort of the big questions, uh, the things that I'm worrying about now as, as I'm looking forward. Now that I'm no longer spending my time being administrator, uh, some of the things that I hope you'll think about it as you set up programs as well. So the first one is, what's the relationship between public humanities and politics? Between social change, between politics, social entrepreneurship. Almost every one of my students, I think without fail, would say public humanities is about social change. Public humanities is about making society better. It's not just about Describing it is not a, um, it's not removed, it's not a neutral kind of work. I'm not so convinced of this. I think it's, it's an open question whether public humanities has to have a politics with it. I don't have an answer with it. I think that there are some good examples of work that do good work for social good, but are not about social change. My, my favorite one is this project that was in Philadelphia that just opened last year. I don't know if you know about the funeral for, for a Philadelphia row house. Uh, done by artists at the Temple Contemporary. Uh, like every other big city, Philadelphia is tearing down lots of houses. And instead of saving one, instead of you know, just noting it as, as history, the artists at the Contemporary in, at Temple um, did a funeral for it. They had a band. They put flowers on it. Uh, they made an event out of this house being torn down. You know, it was one of many hundreds being torn down each year. Um, it seems like you can describe things, you can call attention to them, they don't need to be necessarily about social change. Um, it's an open question in my mind. Um, Brown has just set up the new center for the study of slavery and justice. And the grand opening was Friday. Uh, Ruth Simmons, who was the president of Brown, did so much to get that whole, to, to, did that work of getting it started, came back and gave the talk. And the Providence Journal sent over a reporter, the headline of their story was, Simmons says, center not about activism. Um, which is sort of what she said, but she had a, such an interesting nuanced way of thinking about how the center could be about scholarship and a place for conversation that will, some, that will not be about activism, but that will cause the right kind of activism to happen. And I can't quite figure out that, that angle there, but it seems to me there is some place in between purely public humanities as activism and 
a place where out of which activism comes. And that, that's what, like I say, these are things that I'm talking about, thinking about that don't really have an answer to. One of my current, stu current students, uh, Kate Dietrich, who is very much a, an activist, a, uh, a un former union organizer, I have had lots of interesting conversations about how it is that you can use public humanities to work towards social justice. How political does it have to be? Uh, she has some interesting ideas about, um, well, she points to places like um, not traditional unions, but uh, the workers, uh, what are they called? The workers' organizations, the new workers' organizations, which is now being called alt labor, uh, as places that are activists and do public humanities, that do culture. In some ways, the Wobblies used to do culture. It used to be a left, left uh, unions used to do cultural events. Is there is there a place there that is public humanities that that works? Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure, but it's a really interesting question. Other big question, this is the buzzword of the modern university. Everybody has to talk about social entrepreneurship. I don't really understand social entrepreneurship. I think it's a little bit of a fraud, at least in the humanities side of things. Um, I understand it in some of the international development kinds of things. And I think also, I'm less concerned about entrepreneurship and more about working with existing organizations. But it seems to me that this is a question that we need to think about. Is there a non-profit non public humanities? And maybe being a little bit cynical, is there money to be made in, in the public humanities beyond asking for grants and donations? Um, I'm interested in figuring this one out. The best example I have is actually a very old one. Uh, many of you will know about Folkways Records the organization that Moash set up in the 50s, in the 40s, I guess, late 40s, to uh, basically to, to capture all of the sounds of the modern world, of uh, traditional music, of uh, nature. And he set it up as a corporation. He did not set it up as a nonprofit. And he would talk about that that was, in fact, a very free move for him. He didn't need to worry about donors. He didn't need to worry about a board. He could do what he thought was right. And as long as he didn't worry about getting paid very much, he could do the work, sell the, sell, the, sell the music, sell the recordings, and um, do this important work. Of course, you might point out, he didn't pay any of his uh, musicians the royalties that he said he would, so it didn't completely work. But again, something to think about. Um, public humanities and technology is clearly a topic we've got to talk more about. Uh, digital humanities is one approach to it, but that seems like a narrow piece, that's sort of the, the doing of the research. And it's appealing because that becomes public so much, so easily. Uh, but there's other ways to think about public humanities and technology. The people who've done really interesting work on this is the Civic Media Lab at MIT. Um, they have this project that they call low-tech data murals. So these are big murals painted on the side of buildings, done by community groups that get data back to the people. Uh, this is in Somerville about food security in Somerville. Uh, Kate Dietrich, my student, points to another project which I'm sort of fascinated by, this website, Contradoros, which what she describes as this Yelp for migrant workers. Uh, how do you reach migrant workers in a useful way by letting them review and, and give comments on the people they're working for, but also get, uh, get, get their culture back to them through that kind of website. Finally, or almost finally now, a humanities crisis. No talk on any topic in the universities is complete without talking about the crisis in the humanities. To my mind, there's only a crisis in the humanities if you define humanities in the narrowest possible way, which is if you say humanities is what professors in the humanities do, then yeah, there's not enough students, there's hard to get funding. If you define it as the culture that communities have, that everybody has their own versions of humanities, then in fact, I don't see there is a crisis. There is, I think it's fair to say, a serious crisis that is worth thinking about, and that's the humanities jobs crisis. Um, it's, and I'll get to this more in a little bit. It's really hard to make a case for the amount of training of PhDs that is going on in universities. Um, considering the job crisis is So I think there's not a public humanities crisis, but
but there is a narrowly defined humanities crisis, and there is certainly a humanities crisis. So that brings me to the PhDs. Uh, Brown is now thinking about how to redo this American Studies PhD. Um, and I'm a skeptic, I must say, um, about the usefulness of the PhD as it's currently designed for public humanities work. In some ways, it trains people to do everything wrong. It trains them to write badly. It trains them to focus on a narrow audience. Um, but you could change it in interesting ways without too much work, I think, to make it more useful beyond the university, maybe more useful for the university. Uh, one thing is I think that some of those skills should be included. The other possibility, and this is an article uh, by Joseph Mee, I'm not sure I got the name right, uh, wrote in um, Chronicle not too long ago about thinking about a professional humanities degree that's the equivalent of an MD or a JD, but is a HUMD, a humanities four-year degree that is designed for practical work or designed for teaching work, not designed purely to train uh, PhDs to become professors at research universities, which I think is what it's designed for now. So another topic of conversation. Public humanities are undergraduates. Uh, I'm old-fashioned in thinking that if public humanities is about vocational training, which I think it is, uh, then it's not appropriate for undergraduates. On the other hand, there's an awfully lot of undergraduate training that is aimed at jobs, and there's a lot of that could be taken out of the public humanities that would be very useful for all sorts of undergraduate training and undergraduate jobs. Uh, American Studies program at Brown changed its undergraduate program to require a junior seminar of all concentrators that is about the public. Uh, some of this is very much public humanities hands-on work. Some of it is much more the history of the public. Uh, but there are possibilities around bringing some of these skills into the undergraduate curriculum. I'm still skeptical. I'm not, I will need to be convinced that it isn't. We want to be careful not to make it a degree that looks like an MA, because that really is a narrowing profession. Uh, vocational degree. Uh, public intellectuals, here I think we can't train public intellectuals. Uh, at Brown, one of my bosses, one of the uh, deans kept saying, not the public humanities program, but the public intellectual program. It's not what we do. Uh, I don't think we can possibly compete with the people who do that. Uh, how you train somebody like uh, Tay Nahasi Coates, who is a modern public intellectual, uh, so much so that he can have a picture of Brandt instead of himself on his, on his Twitter feed. Uh, we can't train that. That is a different kind of work. You can train them to write well, you can train students to blog well, you can train them to be public with their work, but I don't think we can, we're in the business of training um, public intellectuals. Um, finally, the nonprofit job crisis. Uh, we've defined we're training students to do great work. I think that they like the work that they do. Our, our alumni are happy. Um, but they're getting paid miserably for the work they're doing. Museum work especially pays far over. Uh, and I think that there is something of a bubble that we're making at the same time, which worries me a lot. This public history people have been talking about. It's a good bit. We're training. Uh, universities want to have master's programs because they make money from them, so we produce a lot of master's programs. There's master's programs in public history, especially, so we'll have PhD students in public history that can teach people in public history. MA programs, there aren't jobs at the end. This is something we need, we need to think about all that. And finally, my, my last one, uh, something that worries me as I look at my students, and where is the students? We're doing important work but we're doing it based on just a very female sense of you don't need to get paid for this work because it's for the community's good. And so we need to think about how we can be professional, do professional work that is also at the same time personally important work. And this is always the problem with teaching, uh, it's been the problem with music work. How do you switch back and forth between Yes, I'm doing this for the good of the community, and yes, it is professional work and I should get paid for it. Uh, this is something that I'm trying to explore with my students now, how to get 
um, how to be both enthusiastic and um, engaged personally, but also to say this is about being a professional. So again, some of the things that I've been thinking about as I've been no longer being an administrator and starting to uh, sort of think of the big picture again. So thanks very much. Questions on your own. Sure. Intermediary. I, mean, I have plenty, but I'll let other people. I hope I was provocative enough to tell us that you were thinking about setting up programs. Anyway, I'll start with the questions because it's, it's, I mean, I'm really parallel and think a lot about your principles and they're things we've been trying to do at UMass. Um, so, very sympathetic with the whole presentation. Um, one word that didn't get mentioned at all, though, which is interesting, and it, it, again, maybe it's the difference, is um, the state, capital S state. Because I think that when we're talking about the collapse of public humanities, we're really also talking about this larger question of the public sphere, money, and all that. And uh, it's something that Having spent my career at a public university, I'm always like aware of on a pretty much daily basis. And so I, I think that that's sort of something that needs to also be probably in the mix in terms of training students to think about. I think that's very important. And we talk a lot about the public in our courses, but not so much about as we probably should have helped the state. The state becomes this odd, uh, you know, there's NEH out there, and there's university, state universities over there, and there's these organizations that you work with. Um, it needs to be theorized better inside of the field, I think, because we have mostly talked about it as the public and not as much about how that public is organized and where the state comes into it. So, good point. Something Add it to my list. Yeah. So then you're, hi Steve, Dave's the ball. Hi. Um, early on in the slideshow here, you had a description up there of the uh, uh, introductory seminar to public humanities, mm -hmm. and you made a reference to, I think, big ideas or big issues in the public humanities. Mm -hmm. And just wondering if you could give me a sense okay. of what those are. Sure. So, each time I do that syllabus over, I come up with three big categories. And those are sort of the big ideas I hope students can learn about and talk about. So this year, I remember the syllabus right, the first third of the class is about the public. So how do you define your public? Um, we read uh, museums in the public sphere, a new book out, sort of trying to figure out how to go from museums as, uh, from the public as a place for dialogue and conversation happens to a public as a place where lots of other things can happen as well. Um, we had read, um, what else? Anyway, part two of that is about heritage. So we're reading uh, the, uh, the idea of cultural heritage. Uh, we're reading um, the Golden Days of Memory, the book about heritage in Charleston. And part three is memory and memorials. So those are sort of three big ideas for this, this semester. Last, last time I taught it, it was culture, curation, and community. So those are three sort of big themes that seem useful to students to come away with. And then each of those find a few books, uh, sign, sign some articles about it, and that, that's the way that course works. If I may? Yeah. And a few slides later, you had a list of the different departments at Brown that yeah. you're connected with and all right. And I noticed that philosophy wasn't one of them. It's true, actually. We've had no connection at all with philosophy. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of this has to do with individuals who I know who seems interested, but I, I'd love to know what I should be talking to philosophy about. It. It's not an obvious one. At Brown, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was yeah. certainly, there's certainly partly it's just schools are decent, idiosyncratic. Economics at Brown has no interest in anything that is 
um, useful or, or connected to the actual world, as far as I can tell. Uh, sociology, though, turns out, is full of people interested in nonprofit organizations and lots of interesting possibilities there. Uh, so part of this is idiosyncratic to Brown. Part of this is very personal, you know, happen to make a connection with somebody who's interested in a particular topic. So, but philosophy is, should be, just hasn't yeah. happened yet. Yeah. Um, when you talk about the public humanities, and I look at the programs that the, um, the center has done with the community in Rhode Island and South Southeastern Mass, mm -hmm. um, I should preface that by saying that I'm with Mass Humanities. So. <laughs> um, one question I have is about public humanities that take outside, take place in a more difficult part of community, that is difficult dialogue, questions about race, uh, diversity, conflict, environmental problems, and the role of the humanities in those. Can you say something about, because that starts to go a little bit closer to those questions of social activism. Mm -hmm. And, and the role for public humanities in perhaps um, finding a place in which to even start by thinking about social activism. So many of our programs address those issues, but rarely directly in the way that, say, a, a Safe Humanities Council might set up a program. We tend to be more, say, with Mashapog Pond, the, one of the big stories there is, as part of urban renewal, a large middle class, lower middle class, black neighborhood, uh, mostly with black owned homes, was destroyed. And we have sort of reconnected that community in, in some ways. Uh, but we're not talking about it in terms of race so much, or activism, it's more about community. Um, we, start, when we started off, we gave some thought to whether we should expand the program beyond the easy student local community thing. So many state humanities agencies and some universities programs uh, are involved with what's called the Clemente program, mm -hmm. which is basically a very intensive humanities, traditional humanities program uh, aimed at the most disadvantaged people. So you know, to be a little bit cynical, it was, you know, can we teach Plato to, to people in jail? Can we, can we do you know, very traditional humanities work um, in a way to people who had never had the opportunity to do it? And that seems to be a very different definition of the humanities than, than what we write with. Uh, partly because those programs are enormously expensive uh, to do, to do well, and to, from what I could understand, looking at them a few years back now, they were not all that successful for the most part. They had a few amazing triumphs and lots of, lots of work that, didn't, that wasn't successful. Um, so we have gone sort of more, we will work with communities rather than we'll go in there and, and talk about these issues they should be talking about. Good question though. Any other questions? Yeah. I'm wondering, I'm thinking about the pressure that many of us are under about assessment and accountability and reporting. And I was really impressed by the, the range of places that students from the public humanities program go. And one of the issues we're facing in public history is that on the one hand, we want to make this argument that this training can take you into a broad range of careers in a, in, in a variety of settings. But when you're trying to talk about your placement rates, when, I mean, it's hard enough in public history, so I guess I'm wondering how you deal with it in public humanities. So it's a real interesting challenge. Um, we keep very, we try to keep track of where everybody is. Um, the last couple of years, in fact, our placement rates have been pretty bad. It's been a really hard time finding jobs. Um, it takes a long time for students to find jobs. And they are, many of them, I think, not in their first choice of jobs. Um, so 
many have gone into either development or sort of the marketing, public relations side of, of humanities organizations. And I don't think that's bad, but it's not where they started out wanting to be. Uh -huh. How do we count that? We occasionally are asked about this. Um, what metric do you use to measure success? And I don't have an answer that's a good one. I can say what percentage are working in jobs in related organizations. That's fairly high. Uh, if they asked me what salaries they were getting paid, it would be pretty scandalously low. Um, I, I don't, so it's, it's a real problem. And to my mind, since at Brown, nobody seems to be looking very closely at that now. The, what, the part that worries me more is what do I tell students who apply for the program? Uh -huh. um, and I try to be honest and say, this is a list of people, this is where they are. Um, the students are very happy. The alumni are very happy for the most part with where they are, and they're sort of an upbeat bunch, I think, by nature. Mm -hmm. But I know what a lot of them are getting paid, and it's not enough to pay off their loans. So it's a real problem. That, that's the part that works, we will see. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about the role of undergraduate teaching here, because many of us uh, in this group are at colleges that are focused solely on undergraduates, and there seems to be a lot of enthusiasm for public humanities of some sort. But I appreciate also what you're saying about not wanting to prematurely focus on some things when they're at a moment at a little art school when they should be thinking very broadly um, rather than in yeah. So, I think it's, I know the new director of the center is very eager to get many more undergraduates involved. Um, and makes a good argument for why this is useful training. Uh, if you're going to be getting a degree in American studies, this is a whole lot more useful than, a, you know, to have a public humanities angle to it, which includes some of these core courses um, in things like, or you know, having done work in things like project management, um, nonprofit management, those are useful skills to have. Um, we teach courses that we actually have a surprising number of undergraduates who take the courses that the center offers. Uh, their Brown is unusual in that it's a small graduate school, and so there's a lot of overlap between courses that graduate students and undergraduates take. And graduate students take undergraduate courses, undergraduates take graduate courses. And when we did the numbers for how many undergraduates are taking our courses, there's, uh, out of the maybe 150 students who take courses in the center, probably 100 of them are undergraduates. So it's a significant number, but it's, a, um, it's not what I focused on. And again, this goes back to some sense of vocational training and just be graduate training. I think that will change. Uh, the, the new American Studies curriculum now requires every undergraduate in the program, in American Studies, to do this course about the public. Um, the new faculty that we've hired are more so than the old faculty interested in public work. So I think, I think that will start to shift around. But it's a wonderful, you know, in some ways, as a, the undergraduates who go into this, they all go on to this kind of work. They love it. So it's an appealing thing to do. Like this. Other questions? Yes. Okay, so I thought the um, public communities clinic was a really fascinating idea. So can you talk a little bit more bit about that and why you think it didn't work? Yeah. So the notion was that we, we, one of the things that the center has is this wonderful building with a lot of space. And the thought was we turn this into a space where there's a physical place where you can go and there are sort of people waiting behind the counter saying, how can I help you? What's your public humanities concern? You know, what can we do for you today? You know, take a number and, and here's, you know, the designer's on call and you can use that big printer over there to print your thing and you can, sort of like a design shop and production shop and oral history, you know, check out a recorder, check out a video camera. I think it was probably a staffing issue, first of all. We didn't really have staff to make it work. Um, I couldn't figure out how to get students to do that work. It sort of required 
required more expertise than the students had for the most part. Uh, when it worked was when I put a lot of effort and time into it and sort of did other people's work for them, which I didn't really like. I think if you had two or three professionals in that work with a range of skills in that in that in a clinic with that set of skills, um, you could do really useful work for a whole range of really tiny organizations in 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 a place like like this area. Um, I think. At some level, you're putting local designers and fo other folks out of work, which is a problem. Although maybe you hire them to, to, to man the, the counter at the Public Humanities Clinic. The notion in, at the Environmental Health Clinic in New York, which I think also failed, because it hasn't updated the website in a couple of years, uh, was you come in, here's my environmental health problem, and you're given sort of a prescription to go off and talk to these people and talk to that organization and look up this data, and here's, here's some other data you can take with you, and come back when you've you know, done that kind of work. In some ways, it had a more political feel rather than a practical feel. Um, the other question, we, when we set it up, everybody said, no, 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 it's a public humanities lab. That will sell. You can raise money for something called a public humanities lab. I really think it's about being a clinic. I really like the notion of sort of public health as a model. So, but they would need more money and more people, I guess. Yeah. Back in the day, and I don't know whether they're still functioning, I don't think they are, but upstate New York had the Regional Council of Historical Organizations. And there were about 22 counties that were represented and it regularly went across all of upstate New York. And my understanding is one of their main functions was sharing expertise, sharing equipment, all these kinds of things. And I think they're not in existence anymore for the same reason that they don't have the money kind of going. coming into the center to keep them going. But for a while, they were very successful. So it, it seems like it's, it's the sort of idea that um, you know, the New England Museum Association or somebody like that could do this. It, it, it's a challenge to figure out the funding and to figure out how it's not just competing with folks trying to make a living doing the same kind of work. Well, also, uh, in, it, it's probably aware of that, maybe not, uh, Massachusetts doesn't have any state museum association because the Bay State Historical League went out of business in 2003. And when it did, one of its functions was, in fact, to do this expertise and sharing. And they had thermometers, and, or not thermometers, yeah. but you know, the hydrometers and all that stuff they would share. And the problem was it was an umbrella organization, and nobody wanted to pay the dues to the center. Everybody was passionate about their local historical society, but nobody saw yeah. the, the umbrella part. And I think that that is an issue, would be, too. That would be another issue. Yeah. Well, I think, um, to your credit and in your defense, it seems like a lot of these projects, in, a, in effect, that the students and you are doing accomplishes many of the same things. But I was just kind of thinking down the line a little bit that just as a, as a graduate student myself, knowing that these uh, resources exist and that uh, faculty uh, department is willing to help that when you know in a sense as an ambassador an agent you know in the normal course of you know going you know conducting your business encountering organizations all the time that would benefit in one way or another and knowing that this you know that there's like-minded people that there's a tradition within a faculty or within a department to aid where aid is needed um, is tremendous Short of having a drop-in plan, perhaps, you know, a full-staff drop-in plan. So, so, so we, we have often, there are, especially for small historical organizations, and Rhode Island, like Massachusetts, is full of these small, no-staff kinds of organizations. We've been able to provide help and, you know, do some cataloging for them. The place that has done this really well is the University of Delaware Museum Studies Program, which organizes a month-long SWAT team where for three weeks in January, um, 20 students will descend on a little historical site and rehouse everything and catalog everything and sort of make it all better, get lots of experience out of it. And, um, you know, it's, it serves a real need. And my guess is that the students get an enormous amount out of that kind of very practical work. One of our challenges is that we're not a museum studies program, and so our students tend not to have the sort of very practical how to build a um, you know, a new box to fit something into kinds of things that Del Delaware program teaches. 
So we're sort of this mid-level step above that that makes it hard to you know, consult. You know, the doctor is in China, the, <laughs> the public humanist is in, uh, sign the, on the door. It's sort of hard to know exactly what questions you can come and ask that person. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I'm like, I run an arts management program at UMass, and we um, have a sort of different approach. We actually take a, a semester long, so we work with an agency. So financial management class will work with an organization for an entire semester. Fundraising class and working class will take several with larger numbers of students. We can't go in for three months and fix their mess, but we can actually analyze it and help them and hand them back at least the paper that says here. But the good thing is the students learn how to analyze an organization from at least this one perspective, and they bring a lot to it. So it's really fun. But we're always looking for case study organizations, places that are willing or that would like to have that kind of depth of, you know, in some ways it's really invasive, but in another way they love it at the end. The course that we offer, Management of Nonprofit Organizations, is, or Management of Cultural Organizations, is very much um, project-based. Uh, it's taught by a local nonprofit consultant, and she will say, "There's these three, these three organizations. You need to go in and do a project that they need done for them." Mm -hmm. So in some ways, it's similar. They're figuring out uh, how this works, what the problems are. Um, it's sometimes successful, sometimes not. It's a challenge to have students who are still learning things descend and try to fix these places problems. Uh, another class, not offered through the center, but is appealing is a philanthropy course where students actually give away money um, and do a very good job of analyzing. I was skeptical at first, actually, but do a very nice job of analyzing what it is that um, how to set up a uh, set up organizations requirements and talk very carefully about what kind of grant would make a difference to an organization. Write uh, write calls for proposals and what work with organizations. And so again, this hands on kinds of work that's useful to the organization and is useful for, for training students as well. Who funds that program? The philanthropy program? That, giving the grants? That was run, that was run out of the Square Center at Brown, which is Brown's program. It's sort of the service learning program. It doesn't like to be called that. Um, it's set up another organization, which is sort of, again, not a model of this public humanities clinic, they call it the Tri-Lab, which I forget exactly what it stands for, but it, it's an intensive, um, year-long, I think, of course, with graduate students, undergraduates, working with mostly public health-related problems. They haven't got any public humanities problems uh, in Providence. Very intensive public health and education are the two places they're working on. Uh, sort of a research and um, a lab to do local work that needs to be done. So that, that's an interesting model too. What are you going to do next? <laughs> well, I promised I was going to write a book about museums. So <laughs> I have a contract and now I have to actually do it. So it's sort of a scary thing. Uh, based on the Lost Museum uh, project, the Jenks Museum. I'm going to write a book about um, what it is that museums used to be and could be sort of very much an idiosyncratic take on museums. That I guess, I hope somebody will be interested in reading. But that's, that's, that's what I promised I would do when I was done. Because one of the, I, I came to Brown um, from the Smithsonian and I came with tenure. So I never have been through any of the, the dealing of trying to get tenure and trying to be an academic. And I've sort of been very fortunate to be able to be outside of this whole system and pretty much do what I want to do and uh, not, not to have to be indoctrinated into being a professor. So I'm trying to hold on to that even though I'm no longer offering my own center. Well, it's, it's close to seven, so um, we should let everybody go and thank our speakers.